Hello ladies and gentlemen, today in War Thunder I was going to talk about the Summertime Madness event, uh, it mirrors the one from last year very much, uh, but at least last year you were guaranteed to get the vehicle if you completed all the challenges, where this time you have a chance. So I am thoroughly against this kind of idea where uh, the probability is stacked against you but they still want to make you do all these challenges and to be honest I don't want to talk about it so I, I was really looking forward to having a go with it but also another thing that's stopping me is the fact that in War Thunder um, as you can probably see from the video on your screen my ping is at 999 the maximum it can be uh, probably even more than that on the servers right now check my internet connection it's the same as always so I have no idea what's going on so instead I thought I'd tell you about some books that I really enjoy. Now, they are very personal to me, uh, just because of what they're talking about and where I'm from originally and everything like that. And what I'm talking about is a series of books uh, written by Patrick Otter. Now, he's well known for writing stuff like the Yorkshire Airfields in the Second World War, Lincolnshire Airfields in the Second World War, and also a book which is absolutely wonderful if you want to read it. It's called One Group, The Swift to Attack, Bomber Commands Unsung Heroes. So as you can tell, Patrick Otter really enjoys uh, Bomber Command in Britain in World War II. And that's probably my favourite part as well, which really is the reason why I'm tied to him. Also, um, I have all of his books, but I'm going to be reading from Yorkshire Airfields in the Second World War. It's basically a book which outlines all of the airfields that were in Yorkshire at that time and uh, what they were used for. They were mainly used by Bomber Command, obviously, uh, just because of the situation of Yorkshire uh, compared to where France is. It's a good location and also uh, where it's compared to the east, uh, well, not the east side of Europe, but basically... Uh, Finland and Sweden and that belt, uh, the Scandinavian countries, just because obviously a lot of industry and stuff like that was created there by the Germans. So it made sense to put them. It made sense to put them in Yorkshire, whereas it put, um, uh, it put and made a lot of sense to put fighter command mainly in the south to protect against the invasion and obviously to help with the Battle of Britain. So the Yorkshire airfields in themselves, um, and the Lincolnshire airfields, uh, another book by him talks about them, they were mainly bomber-centric. And for me personally, uh, British bombers are what I'm mostly interested in. There are a lot of other topics in World War II that I really enjoy reading about, like Zigzag, uh, Operation Zigzag, if you know what that is. If you haven't, on YouTube, there is a wonderful documentary in parts on Operation Zigzag and the whole thing, even with uh, interviews with Zigzag himself. Absolutely amazing. Uh, also, i am uh, always been interested in escaping from POW account, uh, camps on both sides of the fights. Uh, the North Africa War has always interested me, and also Italy. But unfortunately, there aren't many games or stuff out there which really talk about them. A lot of them seem to be centralised around the France campaign and the German campaign, so unfortunately I can't really extend my knowledge uh, into gaming when it comes to stuff like that. But anyway, if you're going to pick up a book and you want to know more about Bomber Command in World War II, uh, first of all I would recommend the Swift to Attack Bomber Command's Unsung Heroes, one group, uh, by Patrick Otter. It's about 20 quid. So about 40 bucks on uh, on Amazon, uh, if you can find it. I'm on the UK version of Amazon right now, just looking at it. But you can get a Kindle edition if you have a Kindle for 11 quid, so that's, you know, $22. And the other ones, uh, the Yorkshire Airfield and Lincolnshire Airfield one, they're around $12.99, uh, which is, of course, $25 around. It's about 1 to 2 right now, the ratio, if you're from America or Canada. And I would say they are definitely worth it, uh, even if you just want to find out more about how Bomber Command operated and how it all worked. Another book uh, would be Sir Hugh Dowding's biography, and I actually got a book which is Sir Hugh Dowding's biography 
and also a Battle of Britain book uh, inside it. So half of it is the biography, half of it is the Battle of Britain book. And it is a wonderful read because it shows Dowding's personal stuff and what was going on, especially with all of the arguments and disagreements he had with all his commanders, and then it shows what actually happened, um, not just uh, Dowding's own view. And it talks about all the bureaucracy with it all, and all of that stuff. Uh, Just because you've got to remember, there was a lot of opposition to how Dowding ran things, uh, because he was seen as uh, a bit of an old school kind of guy. But, you know, if I. He is one of my personal favourites. Hugh Dowding is one person who at the time of when he was doing everything a lot of people disagreed with him and then straight after the battle of britain uh, after his main role had been done he was able to stave off the um, axis advances people started to respect him and then a few years later they realized that oh hello um a lot of the stuff that he actually said made a lot of sense but because of he was a very crass man he said it how it is, he didn't like fluff. Like, there, there's a very special scene in um, the Battle of the Britain film. Now, I'm not saying it's fully accurate or anything like that, but there's a scene where one of the politicians is talking to Hugh Dowding. It's very much at the start, and the politician is going, yes, uh, I've got a, a factory owner who can say he can give you 200 spits a month, or 200 spits a week. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we can easily fight off these uh, German advances. advances. And Dowding turns around and goes, well, the Germans have five pilots to our one. That means that our boys are going to have to shoot them down about three to one. This also means that we may have a ton of planes on the ground, but what we are struggling for is pilots. And his whole tone um, through that movie, the guy who actually plays Dowding, is absolutely wonderful. Like, he he masterminds the role himself. Now, there are a few bits of that movie which are a bit melodramatic, and obviously the romance and stuff, it's kind of a bit weird and out of place, but the person who plays Hugh Dowding, I think, did an absolutely great job. But anyway, I'm from a little village. Uh, I was born in Beverly, uh, in East Yorkshire, and I'm from a little village uh, where I spent most of my life called Goodmanham. Uh, which is right next to a place called Market Wheaton, uh, which is the resident town of the area. Now, Beverly is kind of the major town of East Yorkshire, or the East Riding of Yorkshire, uh, near Hull. But uh, I lived about maybe 20, 25 minutes away from that. And the closest airfield to me was home upon Spaldingmore, or what it says in this book, home on Spaldingmore. Now, I've always known it as home upon Spaldingmore, and uh, just as a bit more background, I used to play for a team called Pocklington. Uh, I used to play cricket and rugby for them. Uh, you know, rugby in the winter, cricket in the summer. I absolutely loved it. I ended up playing for the first team there uh, in cricket anyway. I, I moved out to Canada before I could get into the first team and had uh, for rugby and had many injuries as well. But the closest one to me on this map is home on Spaldingmore and... The way it's described in this book is perfect. It encapsulates the area. I've been to the area. I've been to what used to be the airfield there um, quite a few uh, years ago. And the thing is, a lot of these airfields now have obviously just been turned into farmland, or they're just a few abandoned places. Now, there are a few which still stand. There's one at Pocklington, uh, which, uh, you know, is about 10, 15 minutes away from me. We're home on Spaldingmore, maybe 5, 10 minutes. Uh, the Pocklington one has a very respectable gliding club and you know they offer people if you want to get taken into the air and you know driven around or if you want to learn you can do that Uh, so some are still operational I think the biggest ones in the area are Linton on Ooze uh, which is uh, still used and that is just north of York I believe or it's near that anyway oh no sorry it's northeast of Beverly I'm thinking of somewhere else and uh, the other one is Leckenfield, which is now military barracks. Uh, I'm not sure if the airfield is still operational, but, you know, it's it's still around that area. Uh, another place which 
was home to where I actually went to do some work experience was Bruff. And that used to have a massive BAE Systems factory there, where I did some work experience. I actually got to work on the line and see how they uh, put everything together. And they used to have signs everywhere saying, you know, watch out for FOD. And what they meant by FOD was foreign object debris, because obviously just something stuck in the aircraft, you know, it could wobble about and break something. But they have uh, a fully operational airfield there where we got to see uh, some jets come in and out. Um, but I'm not sure if it's there anymore. I remember there was some word of it maybe closing down, but it might be there. You know, I mean, I, I enjoyed working there. And uh, it's always nice to see an airfield and not just see some of the old planes, but see some of the present planes uh, just to see how technology has advanced. But anyway, I'm going to be talking about a little village called Melbourne. Because, to me personally, I played at uh, a lot of the villages and towns this place talks about. I actually played either rugby or cricket there, because every place has its own cricket team or rugby team, depending on uh, how big it is. Usually the villages have cricket teams, and the larger villages or the towns have rugby teams. It's kind of just how it works in my area. And Melbourne was a place where... I I was looking through the book, I was going to talk about Home Upon Spalding more, and maybe Bruff, but I remember there was a key match, I was 15 at the time, and we were playing against Melbourne, uh, playing for the third team at Pocklington, and usually, uh, you know, when you go to fourth, third, second or first teams, they're for the adults, but I was 15 at the time, and I remember batting at like number nine, and basically sitting on the boundary the whole time because I had a decent arm at that point. And, you know, scoring a few runs, and we eventually won that match, and did really well. Uh, but it's it's a special place for me, just because of that moment. It was the first time I'd ever played as a teenager for an adult team. And then, from that confidence, I was able to break into the Pocklington first team when I was 16 and 17. And uh, I'd probably still be there now, uh, if I didn't go to university and come to Canada where I've obviously played for teams around me here. But anyway, we're going to talk about Melbourne uh, from the book. It's page 215. But, as I said, these books are wonderful and they're cheap. It's as simple as that. Uh, I've talked to Patrick Ochter a little bit uh, through email, and he seems like a swell guy. And to be quite honest, we're into the same stuff, and that's all you, that's all you really need uh, when... You know, you, you want to talk about things. He's a guy who's given me a lot of advice when it actually comes to uh, Bomber Command and everything like that. He's given me a lot of resources to read, uh, just so I can get historical stuff correct. And that's always nice, uh, especially somebody as well-known as him, uh, you know, giving his time to uh, random people. But anyway, let's get started. And I'll read an ex excerpt from this. So this is Melbourne, number 23 airfield in the uh, Yorkshire region. On the night of the 19th, November 1943, a Halifax Mark II with 10th Squadron was returning from a raid at Leverkusen in the Ruhr when the crew picked up a radio message. Their home base at Melbourne, near York, was fogbound, and Flight Sergeant Holdsworth and his crew in KKT were advised to divert to Tangmere. At 9.35pm that night, as the Halifax tried to land, it struck a hangar and all the crew were killed as the, air crash, as the aircraft crashed and caught fire. A little over an hour later, and near Ford Airfield, a second Halifax from 10th Squadron overshot and crashed as it too returned from Leverkusen, where it had been damaged by flak. This time, the crew was more fortunate. Four of them, including the pilots, pilot officer Lucas, were injured and were to spend some time in hospital before returning to the squadron. The events of that night were nothing new to the crews of, of 10th Squadron, nor indeed for those of any other 4th Group crews whose aircrafts in the Vale of York were blighted by autumnal fogs. The irony, however, was that as the Halifaxes had taken off late that November afternoon for the Ruhr, workmen were busy installing the equipment which would have prevented the diversions of the 10th Squadron aircraft. Earlier that year, Melbourne had been selected as the 4th Group airfield to be fitted with FIDO. 
the acronym for Fog Investigation and Dispersal Operation. It was to be the most northerly of the operational airfields to receive the equipment, and the second in Yorkshire. The other was the emergency landing strip at Carnaby. Compared with some airfields further south, Fido at Melbourne was to be used sparingly, with some 120 takeoffs and landings being recorded as the Fido assisted, half of them in the last week of December 1944. The truth was that Fido came a year too late for the bomber squadrons in Yorkshire, and even when it did finally come into operation, many aircraft from the country opted to use airfields further south. Work had started on the FIDO installation in August 1943. Main contractors were George Wimpy, and the equipment was officially handed over to the RAF on the 15th of January the following year. FIDO was consisted of lengths of burners on each side of the main runway, the heat from which was sufficient to disperse all but the thickest of Yorkshire pea supers. It was hugely expensive in petrol. The first burn at Melbourne consumed some 120,000 gallons of petrol, but had a dramatic effect on visibility. Used on the night of the 27th to 28th of May for aircraft returning from a raid on Borg uh, Leopold, visibility was raised from 300 to 1400 yards. It was a dramatic sight for those living near the airfield when the system was tested for the first time at night in February 1944 for a visiting group of senior officers, some 30 NFS fire appliances from all parts of Yorkshire were dispatched to what was believed to be a major disaster at Melbourne. On the few occasions it was used, Fido proved remarkably effective, although the crews found landing could be an alarming operation. On the 18th of November 1944, thick fog blanketed airfields around York. Melbourne was the only one open and nine of the ten squadron's aircraft got down safely. Flight Officer Daffy and his crew were in the 10th, F for Freddy. They were an, inexper they were an experienced crew, having already completed one tour with 77th Squadron, but this was their first experience of Fido. The heat from the burners appeared to keep the aircraft airborne for too long, and when it finally got down, it was at least halfway down the runway. The Halifax overshooting and losing its undercarriage before finally coming to a halt, the crew scrambling out uninjured. Melbourne was unique in Yorkshire, in that it was used from 1940 to 1945, and was the home of a single squadron, Shiny 10. In 1940, a temporary airfield had been hastily laid out on a large flat area of farmland between the villages of Melbourne and Seton Ross, close to the Pocklington Canal. Some temporary buildings were erected on the site and 10th Squadron, by then at Leeming, used the airfield occasionally during the winter of 1940-41 when the runways at their home base were unusable. The squadron was to fly a number of operations from Melbourne, before finally moving out early in 1941, when work began on constructing a more permanent airfield. It was built with three concrete runways and three hangars, and reopened on the 19th of August 1942, when 10th Squadron returned from a short detachment in the Middle East. By now the squadron had converted to Halifaxes, and brought with it its own conversion flight from Leeming, which remained at Melbourne until moving to Rickall, in October to help form 1658HCU. Melbourne was far from finished when 10th Squadron arrived, and for the first few weeks, bombs and fuel had to be acquired at nearby Pocklington. 10 suffered its first loss from Melbourne on the night of the 6th to the 7th September when Pilot Officer Morgan's aircraft failed to return from Duisburg. This was the first of over 120 Halifaxes to be lost on operations or destroyed in accidents while operating from Melbourne over the next year, over the next two and a half years. Four of them were lost in a single night at the beginning of October when 27 Halifaxes from 4th Group attacked Flensburg and 12 were shot down. Of the four from 10th Squadron, one crashed in the sea off the Danish coast Another came down over one over Flensburg, and twelve were shot down. Of the f uh, sorry, another came down over the target. There were just seven survivors from the four aircraft. 
Despite the losses, there was to be no respite for the Melbourne crews. The following night, they attacked Crayfield in the Ruhr and left behind the wreckage of another Halifax and the bodies of the seven young men on board. A fortnight later, the squadron lost its popular commanding officer, Wing Commander Widley. Uh, sorry, Wildy, who was one of the three to die when the Halifax he was piloting was shot down in an attack on Cologne. He was replaced within a matter of days by Wing Commander Carter. Empty places, whether they be in the cockpit or behind the desk in the CO's office, were never left vacant for long in 1942. Losses were relatively light that first winter at Melbourne, with almost as many aircraft lost in accidents as in operations. One crashed with the loss of the entire crew near the airfield in November, and another came down just outside Seton Ross the following March, again with all the crew being killed. The spring and summer of 1943 saw 10th Squadron in the thick of it in the Battle of the Ruhr. Five men were killed when the Halifax crashed into Sutton Bank after being diverted to Leeming on its return from Dortmund early in May. A second raid later in the morning on the same German industrial city resulted in three aircraft being lost with the deaths of all 22 men. On board, one of the aircrafts was Sergeant Ian Inglis, Inglis who was on a second dicky trip, gaining experience before his own crew, fresh from 1663 HCU at Rufford, began operations. The remainder of his crew had to return to Rufford to pick up a new pilot and were then posted to 76 Squadron at Linton on Ouse, their stay at Melbourne a tragic interlude for them. The Royal Campaign continued with two raids on Essen early in March, the second of these costing 10 Squadron 2 aircraft and the lives of 14 men. There was a narrow escape for a third which was caught by the master searchlight over Essen and then coned by between 20 and 30 more lights. The pilot managed to escape only for the aircraft to be caught again. By now it was the target for just about every AA gun in the Essen area. The rear gunner, Flight Sergeant Jack Sabasalu, was badly injured but continued firing at the lights in an effort to put them out. When the aircraft finally made it back to Melbourne it was found to have been hit 18 times. The wounded rear gunner later recovered and was awarded a well-earned DFM. The Ruhr wasn't the only target of Bomber Command during this period. The Baltic port of Stettin was badly damaged in a heavy raid on the night of the 20th to the 21st April at a cost of 21 aircraft. One of them, from 10 Squadron, was the Halifax flown by Sergeant Percy Glover and was claimed by the German naval flag battery at Cheborg in Denmark. The crew survived, although all were injured. It seems they did not give up without a fight, as several members of the flak battery were wounded by machine gun fire from the Halifax. Those gunners included the squadron's gunnery leader, Flight Lieutenant Baker. The squadron was to lose 13 aircraft in May and June 1943 as the raids continued, with two lost in one night over Cologne. The survival rate was low, just one man escaped from the five aircraft lost in June. More fortunate was Sergeant Ray Smith, the wireless operator, in uh, in Hartnell Beavis's crew. Their aircraft was attacked by fighters on its way home from Essen on the night of the 25th of July and the crew ordered to bail out. Smith was one of the only two to get out before the bomber broke up and crashed. He landed in woods near Tilburg in Holland and was quickly picked up by the Dutch resistance. After being hidden for most of the summer, he began a perilous journey uh, through France in October, part of which was undertaken hanging onto, uh, hanging onto the underneath of a troop train as it headed south. Finally, he and his fellows, es fellow escapees managed to cross the border and by the end of October he was back at RAF Melbourne. The three raids on Hamburg at the end of July and in early August saw the introduction of a window, thin aluminium strips which, when uh, dropped, blinded the German defensive radar. 10th Squadron flew 84 sorties on these raids, all its aircraft returning safely. For some reason, uh, for some reason, 10th Squadron opted to have the windows dropped by its mid-upper gunner, 
which meant him being out of his turret at critical periods. This may have contributed to an attack on Flight Lieutenant Jenkins' aircraft on the third of these raids. The aircraft was badly damaged, but the Canadian rear gunner, Sergeant Dick Hurst, shot down the attacking Ju-88. Jenkins managed to get his badly damaged aircraft back to Melbourne, a feat which earned him a DFC and his rear gunner a DFM. Six weeks later, Jenkins and his crew were in trouble again when they were attacked over Hanover by a night fighter. Despite the serious damage sustained by their Halifax, which had only arrived from the factory a few days earlier, the crew completed their bomb run, and uh, but found to their dismay that their £4,000 cookie refused to move from the bomb bay. When they arrived back at Melbourne, they found that the hydraulics were damaged and the undercarriage would not lower. It was impossible for them to crash land with a live 4,000 pound bomb on board and they were ordered to return to the coast and then bail out. When they did over Patrington, near Hull, their aircraft later crashed harmlessly into the sea. Jenkins and his crew all landed safely. One in the middle of the coastal minefield and they went on to complete their tour at Melbourne the following January. So as you can see, it's not just about the airfields, it's also about the men who man them and where they're from. There are some wonderful stories in this. There's one story of a, a squad of Whitley bombers going to attack the Scandinavian coast, and uh, <laughs> there's a Whitley bomber which was known as uh, like the rickety one, and if your bomber was broken or there was something wrong with it, you got given this awful Whitley bomber. Uh, which was worse than the rest of them because it just didn't work very well. And I want to find that story and try and read it, but I can't find it at the moment. But basically, it took them the whole of the uh, the North Sea to get to altitude above the clouds, and they had to turn around because they were the only plane, uh, the only bomber which was below the clouds because they couldn't get to that height because the damn engines kept freezing because they weren't turning over enough heat because this bomber was in such bad condition. So they had to turn around before they got to the target, because obviously being below the cloud line, all of the AA batteries can see you, and they target you. But for me personally, it's a brilliant book. And not just because it talks about the airfields, but it also talks about people's stories, and how, you know, Yorkshire was a pivotal point and a pivotal place in the Second World War. Maybe it didn't have the glories of the pilots of, uh, the, in, of the South in fighter command, but it definitely played a pivotal part of pushing back the Germans, even if you only see it as destroying their industry to stop them moving. But anyway, cheers, and I'll catch you next time.